Good morning. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself and also our associate pastor, Kathleen Stoles. It's good to see you this morning. I hope each one of you will take a minute. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. hope that you'll uh, pick that up, and if you'll share with us your name and your address information, if you're visiting with us today, uh, there's some space for that. We'd love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church, so we'd love to have that opportunity to, uh, to uh, be in contact with you in that way. So I hope that you'll take those and pass them down and then pass them back towards the center. Uh, I want to lift up a couple of announcements here as we get started. First, uh, the Interfaith Hospitality Network. Again, we're going to be hosting our homeless guests. That'll be happening in the first full week of February. And there's information about how you can get involved in the bulletin. We also have a new members class. It's coming up in a couple of weeks on February the 11th. Uh, it's going to take place right after this service. It's going to be in Boker Hall right up, uh, right up the stairs here. And we will provide lunch and also childcare if you need it. Please uh, RSVP to the church office and let us know if you plan to attend. We'd love to welcome you there. Finally, uh, I want to lift up uh, one change to the schedule today um, because of the Eagles. So because of the game today, we're going to change the time of our youth group and confirmation meetings this evening. So just for this week, we're going to move them up and start at 4.30. So our youth and confirmation classes are going to meet uh, 4.30 to 6 this evening, okay, instead of the normal times. So we look forward to that, and uh, yeah, go Eagles. So I think those are all the announcements. And uh, Kathleen, will you lead us in the call to worship? Good morning. I invite you to stand as you're able and join me in our call to worship. Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are never alone. God promises over and over again, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have been gifted with God's ongoing presence in our lives. God has given us the spirit to be our constant companion comfort and guide.
You may be seated. I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. Loving God, there are times in each life when there is no one, no one with whom to share a word, a laugh, a sad remembrance, a gentle touch, a fond embrace, a kiss of love. Bless each one who suffers from such loneliness. Enrich life with a friend or gentle stranger who will spend a moment noticing and loving. In those times, your love shines through. The world is reborn and Christ is known. So be it. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. We are not alone. Christ walks among us in this community of love. You are God's beloved. You are God's beloved. In, in Jesus, Jesus' name, name. Amen. amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment to greet those around us with the peace of Christ. You were looking very nervously over here during that first service, like... There's something going on behind me. Yeah, yeah. Look, and Phil had the car in the <laughs> I'd like to invite the children to come forward for our children's time. Bradley, Isabel, anybody else? Here we go, Eric, come on up. Let's sit here. So everybody's got a team on their minds today. There's a special team. Do you have a team on your mind today, Bradley? No, no team on your mind. Team on your mind, Eagles, yeah. Team on your mind, Vikings? <laughs> well, it occurred to me as I was reading the scripture for today that it really is about a team. And I'd like to call it Team Church. What do you think? So listen to way this is a little bit different, uh, a little bit different than the one you're going to hear later. The apostles were doing many miracles and signs. Okay, now listen carefully. Everyone felt great respect for God. All the believers stayed together. All the believers shared everything. They sold their land and the things they owned. And then they divided the money and they gave it to people who needed it. The believers met, to get to, met together in the temple every day. And they all had the same purpose. They broke bread in their homes. That means they had a meal together. And they shared their food with joyful hearts. They praised God and all the people liked them. More and more people were being saved every day and the Lord was adding these people to the group or the team of believers. So what are some of the things that Team Church did, does together? Whether we do it now or we did it then, what are some of the things that Team Church does? What'd you hear in that scripture, anything? What were some, uh, one thing? They eat together, yeah. What else do they do together? They prayed together, right? And they praised God together. And did you hear the part about they sold all their land and they put all their money together? And then they gave it to people that needed it. We do that too, don't we, as a team church, right? So what does a team do? What does the Eagles team do? They play football, but why do they play? Do they want to, what do they want to do? What's their purpose for playing football? Do they have a purpose for playing football? Do they want to win? Right, that's their purpose. They want to win. So 
all of the people in the, on Team Church, in the first church and today, we all have one purpose. What's our purpose? You know? If you look up there, you're going to see it. Our purpose is to love God, to serve others, and to transform lives. Okay? That's what we want to do. And that's what those people were doing then. So the purpose of Team Church has never changed. The way we do it might be different because now the church is all over the world and that church that they were talking about there was only in one place. But it quickly spread because everybody wanted to learn more about God and everybody had the same purpose, to love and to serve and to transform or change lives. Okay? So the Eagles is a great team. But we know that Team Church is the one that's ultimately always going to win, right? That's who we are. We believe that Team Church, with Jesus Christ as our head, is the one that's going to work, uh, always going to win, and we want to make sure we follow them. We can follow other teams, too. We could be part of a soccer team or a football team or other teams, but we want to make sure that Team Church is the one that really shapes our lives, Okay? Before you go back to your seats, let's say a prayer. Would you repeat after me? Loving God, thank you for Team Church. Thank you for Team Church. Thank you for those early disciples. Thank you for those early disciples. And thank you for your Son Jesus. And thank you for your Son Jesus. Who taught us to love. Who taught us to love. And to serve others. And to serve others. And to transform lives. And to transform lives. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Go Team Church.
Today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Before I get started, I just need to change out the batteries. I should have looked at that earlier. I apologize. But it's better to realize that now than later, I suppose. But depending on how the sermon goes, I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. All right. Except that I always seem to put them in wrong at the moment. There we go. Success. There you go. Perfect. So over the past couple of weeks, um, as we've undergone this series, uh, we've been talking about the Good Samaritan, and we started off with that text, and started off with reflecting on that story and what it had to say about the people that we encounter in our daily lives. And really, the whole concept of the series is to think a little bit more deeply about what it means to have neighbors and to be neighbors. So the Good Samaritan story introduces us to the idea that our neighbors are people who are in need, but it also introduces us to the idea that our neighbors can be those who come to our aid when we are in need, and that our help comes sometimes from places where we don't expect. And so today, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that sometimes we can't very effectively see the needs of the people around us until we first learn to recognize that need in ourselves that we've been ignoring. So in other words, we'll not be able to atten pay attention to the needs of those around us until we first recognize that we too have that same problem. It's just that we haven't admitted it yet. So today we're talking about what it means to recognize our neighbors as those who are lonely. So let's take a moment, let's pray together, and then we'll get started. God, we give you thanks for your work in our lives. We thank you for the way that you have surrounded us with love, the way that you have given us the gift of your scriptures, the way that you've given us the church as this community of faith. And Lord, we just pray that as we uh, think about these things together, that you might surround us with encouragement, with love, with a word that we need to hear here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is probably one of the most counterintuitive, but probably one of the most deeply true things that we can say about the world that we live in today. And that is, the more plugged in we get, the more disconnected we feel. So the more connected we feel electronically, the less kind of personal, human, emotional connection we have to each other the point where if you do a little search on loneliness, some of the articles that'll come up are things like the loneliness epidemic, right? Talking about this almost in terms of it's kind of a disease, right? All of us are affected by this, by this deep loneliness. So we can text, we can email people, we can connect with people through Facebook who are all over the globe. A friend of mine was on a trip uh, to Germany, and it was great. He was able to post pictures, and I was able to see kind of what he was doing really in real time. And that's, there's something that's really cool about that. But at the same time, it's not the same as being able to sit across from him and have him tell me about what it was like to be in Germany, right? So it's almost like we're sitting at this buffet of connection, and yet we're starving. 
And I really do think that the idea of starving is the right idea. It's almost like, you know that week between Christmas and New Year's? And in your house, you've got all kinds of stuff to eat, right? Stuff that you like because you made cookies and somebody brought you cookies and somebody brought this and somebody brought that and you've got all this stuff in the house. And so every time that you're feeling just even a little bit hungry and you walk through the kitchen, you reach into that tin of cookies or whatever it is and you eat, and you eat one or two, right? Now, by the time you get to the end of that week, how do you feel? You're like, oh, right? You've had enough butter, right? You've had enough sugar, right, for the whole... You know, for, you feel like for the rest of the year. So, you were hungry, you ate, but you were not satisfied. It tasted good in the moment, but ultimately, it wasn't what you needed. And I really think that that's the nature of the kinds of connections that we experience right now through technology. Now, I know that there is a certain kind of appeal, you know, to a... a, a conversation that you have with someone by text or by Facebook Messenger, or whatever your preferred way of chatting with somebody is at a distance. The appeal of it is that it's happening in slow motion. And so you have the time, kind of all the time in the world, to think of the most witty thing that you could possibly say in response to something that somebody's just said to you. Right? You can be like a hundred times funnier in a text than you would be if that person were sitting across from you and having the conversation. You can, you know, sit down and just craft the perfect response. You might delete it four times before you actually send it, right? But by the time that you send it, it's perfect. And then when you send it, you're waiting and you're kind of anticipating what that person's going to reply back to you. You see the little bubble pop up, you're kind of anxious about it, you're really ready to see that the person think it was funny, right? So there's this whole feedback loop that's very much like eating sugar for days upon end. And it's designed to be that way. It's designed to be addictive in that way. But there's always this little thing in the back of your mind. And this is where I think the dissatisfaction comes from. This is the, oh wow, I just ate a bunch of cookies dimension of it. Is <clears throat> that you always know, somewhere in the back of your mind, that you really don't necessarily have that much of that person's attention. Now, how do you know that? Well, you know that because, in reality, they only have a part of your attention, too. Because while you're having that text conversation, you're doing something else. Because we're all too busy to actually just sit there and just wait, right? We set the phone down, and then we walk away, we do something else, we come back to it. That's just the way that life is working. But we know that. We know that they never have our full attention. We're never giving them our full attention. We also know that the person who's sitting in the room with us that we're supposed to be spending time with, right, whether that is our spouse or our kids or whoever, they're also fully aware that they're not getting our full attention. And so in all of this, we always are keenly aware of the fact that we're never really present. And that person that we're conversing with is never really present to us either. And I think that's why when we get to the end of that conversation, we don't necessarily feel a lot better than we did when we started it. And yet, even though we are experiencing this kind of profound lack of connection, one of the great ironies of today and the way that we live our lives is that we also go to great lengths to take the little kinds of moments of human connection out of our lives by design. So here's an example that I found pretty striking the other day. I was reading this article about silent chairs in hair salons. Now, can you guess what a silent chair is? So when you book your appointment, you can request the silent chair, and what that means is I will be released from the responsibility of having to talk to my hairdresser. <clears throat> this little moment of human connection, you know, I tend to think of hairdressers, bartenders, and pastors kind of in the same kind of, they all have a very similar job, right? 
You know, we listen to people. That's what we do. That's, that's the task. Now, some hairdressers like to talk more than others, right? And I get it. There are times when you just don't want to be bothered. But really? Come on. Can you imagine if you were the hairdresser and had to work the silent chair all day? I hope that that's not how that actually goes. <laughs> that would be horrible. It would be like being in solitary confinement, right? I mean, and especially in this moment, um, that's kind of a very, it really is, if you think about it, it's kind of an intimate moment in the sense, who else touches your hair? Aside from your spouse, right? There's, these are like the only two people in the world. You, your spouse, your hairdresser. These are the only people that touch, really touch your head. It's an intimate moment. And you're saying, I don't want you to talk to me while you do this. Like I said, I get it. There are times when I don't feel like talking either. In part because, invariably, well, what do you do? Why are you here on a Monday in the middle of the day, right? It always comes up, well, I'm a pastor, you know what I mean? And so then, sometimes the conversation that you don't necessarily want to have, because you know what I mean. Well, maybe you don't, because that's, you know, maybe you haven't had that experience, but there are times when I don't feel like doing it either. And the place where I go, um, I very seldom get the same person twice in a row. But a couple of months ago, I did have the same, the same person twice in a row. And I had a conversation with this young woman, and you know, it was kind of clear to me, based on what she was saying, that she was there really to help out her family. Um, she had moved from another part of the country and come back really to help out her mom. And there was a big story, you know. But she had a lot of interests that were, went beyond, you know, what she was doing and a lot of reasons for why she was helping. And I, just that conversation had stuck with me. So the next time when I went back and I ended up back in her chair, you know, I followed up on some of those details of some of the things that she had shared with me previously. And just her whole demeanor kind of changed when I started to bring up some of these things like, oh wow, somebody actually does remember Somebody actually was paying attention. Now, I don't say this because I want a medal for talking to the hairdresser, right? I say this to make the point that when we do small things like that, it can make a big difference for someone. And also to make the point that these opportunities exist all around us if we take the time to pay attention. Part of living as Jesus lived, I believe, is connecting with people. Because that's what Jesus did all day long, wherever he went, he connected with people. And he really lived out this idea that you are not alone in the world. He lived it out by what he did, by what he said, by, for example, if you think about how important it is <clears throat> when the lepers come to him to be, to be healed, and he's willing to touch them. Can you imagine what that must be like for somebody who's not had anyone reach out and just touch their hand, touch their arm in years, maybe decades. What would that mean to someone? Right? That moment of connection, super important to Jesus. It's important because people are desperate for it. And it's also important because whether we want to admit it or not, it's also that we're desperate for it whether we want to say it or not, the phone cannot do it all for us. And that's part of the genius of the church. When we look at the early church as it's described in Acts, it's designed as this place where people can connect with each other. That's what happened in those early gatherings. People got together at someone's house, they had dinner, they talked about Jesus, talked about what he had to teach, they prayed together. They took care of each other when people were going through difficult times financially. They helped each other, helped care for each other's families. These are the things that the early Christians did, and that's why the church grew. Some fascinating things, if you've ever read um, Rodney Stark's uh, The Rise of Christianity, I think that's one that uh, your class read a few years ago, right? Um, one of the reasons why Ronnie Stark's sociologist. One of the reasons why the early church grew was because 
Christians were willing to take care of each other and nurse each other when somebody got sick. And so when there was an epidemic that was happening maybe in a city, Christians survived at a higher rate than those who did not have a community and did not have faith, did not have anybody to take care of them. Christians were, first of all, unafraid. Secondly, they were compassionate enough to stay in town when everybody else fled. So one of the reasons for the growth of Christianity is because we survived, because we were in a community. So that's part of the DNA of the church, this caring for one another. Now today, ironically, one of the, uh, one of the things that you learn when you're reading about how do you grow a church, right, which is something that we obviously read about all the time, it talks about the idea of allowing people to preserve their anonymity. More and more people will look online and kind of look at the sermons, look at the service and those kinds of things and make a decision, watch you for a while before they actually decide to show up in person. And there's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's fine. And so one of the things that it talks about or that these different kind of websites and articles will talk about is the idea of, you know, maybe you think about turning down your lighting so that when people come in, it feels a little bit more like a movie theater so that they don't necessarily have to feel obligated to connect in that certain way. They feel a little more anonymous. You know, thank God we've moved beyond the time when we used to ask people to stand up and tell us where you're from. Are you visiting today? Please stand up and tell me where you're from, right? <clears throat> Which is the worst thing, you know, probably that we could ever do. Somebody is uncomfortable being new in a place. So we've learned some lessons. But at the same time, anonymity was never the point of the church. It was never the point of the church. So anonymity might enable you to get in the door, like enable you to step over the threshold more easily to enter in, but anonymity cannot keep you here. It cannot. It's community that will keep you here. And so it's important for us to understand that and to practice that kind of community. Churches today will talk about small groups as the, you know, the, the, the new thing. Sometimes it feels like we're talking about it in that way. Like a new understanding of church beyond what we used to experience. But really the new thing is just an old thing, a very old thing. Like the original thing, the first thing that the church was, was small groups. People meeting in each other's houses people having dinner together. If I ask you this question, <clears throat> some of you are going to laugh, I think. When's the last time you actually used your dining room for dining? Last night? Okay. Seriously. <clears throat> you use your dining room for everything else but that, right? It's for, you know, doing your taxes. Maybe you have a com we have a computer in there, right? That's how we use our dining room. Why don't we have people over for dinner? Why don't we do that anymore? Well, I get it. You know, all of us, you get to the end of the week and everybody's tired and worn out and you've just kind of had enough. And it's a lot of work, you know, to prepare a meal. It's a lot of work to, uh, you know, to make sure that the house is clean. It's very important that the house is clean, you know. Like all these things get in the way. But there's an irony there How do you know you're really friends with somebody? I think that one of the ways that you measure whether you're really friends with somebody is whether they're willing to invite you into their house when it's kind of a mess. And that you're willing to do the same for them. That you don't really care. Like when you get beyond putting on airs, which is kind of what making sure that everything is clean before people come over is, you know, in part about. When you get past that stage, then you know that you really are friends. You really have this connection. And that's how the community is supposed to work. It's supposed to be this opportunity for people to connect with each other. <clears throat> every denomination that I've ever, you know, every clergy person that I've ever worked with from another denomination, we all have the same jokes about 
church potlucks about the idea that, well, you know, we Baptists love to eat, or we Presbyterians love to eat, you know, we Lutherans love to eat, we Methodists love to eat. Yes, we love to eat, because y'all are good cooks, you know, so if you have a potluck, there's lots of good stuff that shows up. I love jello salad like everybody else, right? I really do love jello salad. And there's no other place to experience all the varieties of jello salad like a church potluck, let me tell you. <clears throat> but that was never really what it was about. You know, the eating together was never really just about the eating together, it was really about the being together. So the eating together became a pathway to really being together and being a community together. And so if we can create avenues where people can make those connections. You know, the church is doing its job. Because it's those kinds of relationships that really transform our lives by knowing that somebody cares about us. So here's what I'd say. We have a couple of connections, a couple of challenges in making connections this week, I think, that I want to lay before you. First one is, we first have to recognize, as I said at the very beginning, how it is that we're feeling lonely before we begin to recognize that loneliness in others. So one of my challenges to you is this week, when you go to reach for this thing, try to take some time to really think about why is it that I'm reaching for this thing? Am I really using this thing to build a community that helps me to feel full and connected. In other words, am I picking this up? Am I actually using the phone feature? Like, I don't even think, yeah, the phone, it is on the main page of my, of my screen, but it's not down in the little bar anymore. Because how often do I actually use it? Not very often, right? So are we using the technology to actually connect deeply in a way that actually makes a difference? <laughs> So now I'm getting texts, right? People are <laughs> punking me while I'm here. I am your friend, Mike. <clears throat> are we using that to make connections that are meaningful? Or are we using it kind of like when you're walking through the kitchen and you pick up that cookie, right? And if we find that all we're doing is using Facebook, using Messenger, using text, just to grab a handful of cookies, we are not getting anywhere. And ultimately, we're leaving ourselves feeling worse than we started. So that's the first thing, to recognize that loneliness in ourselves and try to take some steps to alleviate it. Maybe by using our dining room for something other than doing our taxes, right? Second thing is, to begin to recognize that loneliness that exists in others around us by paying attention to these interactions that we have throughout the week. Now, inter loneliness and observing how people are feeling, it can come out in a whole lot of different ways. And I tend to think of there are two extremes that are actually polar opposites of each other but are both indicating the same thing, that someone really is in need of a connection. The first one is when somebody starts to withdraw. You know, somebody that you know uh, from work or from in the community, they start to withdraw. That can be a sign of loneliness. But the opposite can also be a sign of loneliness. That person that you run into, that neighbor that you have that will talk your ear off for 90 minutes every time you see them, right? It's not an accident why they're doing that. All right, so those are the two challenges. Now why, biblically, why does this matter? Well, I want to come back to those promises that we got from the scripture that made their way into the call to worship this morning. At the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus leaves his disciples with these words, I am with you always. That is one of the golden threads that carries throughout the scripture. So the end of Matthew isn't the first time it's said, and it is not the last time it's said. 
We find it throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, this idea, God is always with us. And so if this is the God we serve, if this is the Christ we follow, who cares very deeply that we are connected and that we know we are not alone, then is it not our job to remind others of the same, that they are not alone either? Amen? may be seated. And as we sit and prepare to receive the offering today, I just want to celebrate some of the work that you enable us to do here in the community. One of the things that we have made it a point to be able to do is to open our facilities for the use of the community. And there are lots of ways in which we do that. We have a Narcotics Anonymous group that meets here every Thursday night. We have a Cub Scout pack that is our pack and they meet here. We have Girl Scout uh, troops that meet and use the building here. We host the homeless uh, through about four times a year. We also host uh, Red Cross blood drives, um, which Leslie coordinates for us um, several times throughout the year. So when you support the church, you're also making it possible for us to have this kind of presence in the community. And it's one that I believe is really important. And uh, actually at our uh, church council meeting yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about how we do that and how we do it well. So I thank you for your support, and let's continue to offer God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
you pray with me? God, our helper, you are our great joy. Your Holy Spirit enlightens the minds and hearts of your people. Thank you for always encouraging us to draw near to you in prayer and worship. In times of trouble or concern, we find hope and peace in your presence. Guide our congregation to share the warmth and good news of your love in ministries with people in our wider community. Receive these tithes and offerings in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to God in prayer this morning, let's center our hearts with a moment of silence. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this amazing day, for this day that is a gift to us. We ask that we might use it to be your servants, to be the people that you would like us to be, the people that you created us to be. And on this day, we think of those around the world who especially need, us this, need you this day. They each have joys and they also have concerns. There's illness. There's those who have lost loved ones, and we know some of them, but not all of them. So as we pray today, we pray for our, all the people of our congregation, for this congregation and for the ministries, for those who are hurting amongst us, for those who have lost loved ones in recent days. We especially pray for for the family of Ann Wills, for the family, uh, for Tricia Miller's family on the loss of her mom, for the Adams family on the loss of Margie, and for others that we name now in our hearts. Among those in our congregation, we also celebrate the joys those who have been back with us, who came back today because of the beauty of your day, those that we haven't seen in a while, those who felt drawn to be amongst us. We pray for each one of them that they might continue to grow in strength, that they might be healed of the illnesses that they are fighting, that they might know your peace in the midst of those illnesses for which there are no easy answers. We give thanks for the return of George Milligan to, uh, from the hospital home. Um, we just offer prayers of praise for his return. And for others we know who suffer, those who are in trouble, we think of those who are maybe hiding in loneliness, maybe hiding in bouts of depression, maybe hiding and suffering in ways that they have yet, not yet determined. They just know that life is not right. We lift them up in our hearts now. And we pray for the concerns of this community. We give thanks for all of the, um, the EMTs and those early responders, for our police and our teachers and all those many who give their time and their service so that we might have communities that we can be proud of and communities that serve the needs of its people. We pray for the world, gracious God. We pray for its people, for its leaders. There are so many, but you know them, and you know them by name. We pray for the church, 
for the church universal, for its many denominations, and for its leaders and its members. And most of all, we pray for the mission of the church, that we might continue to learn how to love you more deeply, especially by serving others, and that we might learn to care for others, even those who have brought harm to us. And this day we do pray for the communion of saints, those we have named and those who are unknown to us. We know that there are many souls who have returned to you for life eternal, for eternal rest and eternal peace. We offer these prayers and so much more in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And just to uh, follow up on the Kathleen's prayer for Ann Wills, or for her family, just want to uh, make you aware of the arrangements uh, for her services over the next couple of days. Today, there will be a visitation at Bradley Stowe, a funeral home in Medford from 2 to 4. Tomorrow, we'll have a visitation here at the church from 10 to 11, and the service uh, will be at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So. Um, you know, we give thanks today for Anne and invite you to come and join in the celebration of her life. Let's sing together our final hymn. We go forth from this place with this promise that we are never alone. We go forth from this place to bear that promise out into the world so that others too might know that they are not alone. Go forth in the name and with the power and with the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.